She's got long legs and short shorts, but she ain't got no teeth. She wears a red bandana on her head, and she smiles so, so sweet. She'll steal your heart, a very fish sap should rip apart your soul. She'll torture your mind and waste your time and drag you down the road. Cause she's a Jezebel, St. Andrew Jezebel. Cause she's a Jezebel, St. Andrew Jezebel. Well, hey y'all, you're listening to the St. Andrew's Jezebel podcast. This is Ashley Feller. I'm a third generation Panama City native, and I'm also a singer songwriter. On this week's episode, I'll be covering weekly happenings for the week of September 30th through October the 6th. And I'd also like to say thank you to everyone for donating to my birthday fundraiser for the Salty Cats of St. Andrews. Y'all are the best. Thank you so much. This week's guest is Salty local guitarist Matt Siegel, who's recently began playing music with local band Scratch 2020. I think you're going to like this week's old news segment. This is from September 28th, 1935, and it's a piece called Chasing Rainbows. I can't wait to tell you about all the cool things coming up in St. Andrews this week. So get yourself comfy, grab your favorite snacks, get you a favorite beer, and enjoy the show. If you've ever driven past the Welcome Wall in downtown Panama City, then you've probably seen the new murals. One of the first ones to be completed is a work by Heather Clements. She's known lately for her beautiful watercolor paintings, which often feature naturally beautiful women, nature, and also flowers and mushrooms. I'm really not doing it justice with my words. You have to see it. You can go tonight, which is Thursday, starting at 4, Friday at 11, and also Sunday at noon, and that's inside the tap room. This Friday is the kickoff to the Gulf Coast Jazz Society Annual Jazz Festival in Oaks by the Bay Park. On Friday, it begins at 5.30, and on Saturday, it starts at 12.30. Some of the bands on the lineup include Stephanie Pettis of Rio, Mike Levine, Lisa Kelly and J.B. Scott, Mike Lyle's Freedom Jazz Dectet, David Searing with Bobby Van Dusen, Andrew Tinch, and George Petropoulos. This is a free event. Bring your friends and family and enjoy the music. For more information, visit Gulf Coast Jazz Society's page on Facebook. Of course, this Saturday is the market at St. Andrews. It's in the Smith Yacht Basin, right next to the Shrimp Boat. And they start at 8 in the morning. And there's also live music brought to you by Floriopolis. And that begins at 10 a.m. And this week, the featured musician is Tyler Reese. Sunday is a great day to enjoy brunch with your friends, catch some live music, or relax on one of the marina swings, or you could take a leisurely stroll in Oaks by the Bay Park. However you plan to spend your Sunday, St. Andrews is a great place to enjoy watching the birds, and who knows, you might be lucky enough to see the dolphins playing out in the bay. Okay, y'all, our interview segment is a little longer than usual, and I didn't have the heart to shorten it. So this is all the time I have this week for community events. Make sure you check out the Keep St. Andrews Salty page on Facebook for more. One of the best things about St. Andrews is that you can see live music every day. That's right. There is live music being played somewhere in St. Andrews seven nights a week. Fortunately, my friend Ken Schaefer creates and publishes a weekly schedule for St. Andrews as well as most of Bay County. Ken's spreadsheet schedule is updated often when there's any changes. Ken also shares individual music events and is walking the walk and talking the talk when it comes to supporting live music. Not only does Ken supply the music schedules, but he attends several music performances a week and takes fantastic photos of the musicians. As a working musician myself, I feel blessed to have Ken and his wife Donna as treasured members of our local musical family. Make sure you like and follow Ken's page, Salty Sounds in St. Andrews, and Oh Boy Music on Facebook, so that you'll always know where all the live music will happen. Thank you so much, Ken, for everything you do. Music has played a pivotal role in Matt Siegel's entire life. Matt grew up in a family of music lovers and from a young age took in sounds ranging from classical and opera to folk and the classic singer-songwriters of the 60s and 70s to rock and roll, Motown, blues, the new wave of British heavy metal, thrash, and whatever type of music he could consume. At age 13, all it took was one fateful day when one of his closest friends said, we should start a band. 
Matt spent the first 20 years of his life in New York and played his first bar gig at the age of 16. It was at this time that Matt knew he was a musical lifer, and this was only the beginning. For the next 20 years, Siegel would progress to performing regularly in Texas. His primary project, Seven Years Today, achieved some regional success and toured Texas in addition to the Midwest. During this chapter of Matt's life, he shared the stage with the legendary Ray Wiley Hubbard, as well as Robert Randolph. When Siegel relocated to Panama City, he suspected his life as a professional musician was at its end. However, he planned on forming a weekend warrior band. This would be a fun project to celebrate the heritage of one of his favorite bands, the Allman Brothers Band. He placed an ad in the local Craigslist, which was brought to the attention of David Goldfleece, former bassist of the Allman Brothers and Panama City Beach resident. In 2019, Siegel found himself performing alongside Goldfleece and Gary Allman, who is the cousin of the dearly departed Dwayne and Greg Allman. Fast forward to today, and Matt is currently performing with local musicians such as Tyler James and Voodoo Jelly, Woods the Band, and has most recently joined local favorite Scratch 2020. Today, Matt is here to talk about his new project that is currently in development and hopefully will be ready soon. In the meantime, he's accepted that the idea of settling down and giving up the life of musician likely isn't in the cards for him. We're here with Matt Siegel. So I hear that you're going live soon with a new remote guitar studio. Can you tell us what that's about? Yeah, so uh, a little backstory real quick. In previous life, in some of my bands in Texas, I would do engineering and production for our releases. And I'm very much a fan of the do-it-yourself movement, especially when funds are tight. So my bass player and I, we, you know, we learned to mix and record. And when COVID hit, I was really like, I really want to get back into recording. We have all this downtime. My main touring band was doing nothing, as you know, many people were. So I got into recording again, and I started going down the path of doing a remote studio. And then as I got into it, just some things happened. And I was like, you know, I don't know if this is really the right fit for me. But recently, I started talking with some fellow musicians. And it seems that there's a need for session guitarists that can record remotely. I've got a full recording set. You know, I'm using Pro Tools. I'm using an, a universal audio interface, which is, you know, top of the line. And, you know, I have great gear. And I love just playing guitar and I love adding something to people's music or, you know, in the way that serves the song. Whereas I think, honestly, when you have to record and mix or maybe produce someone, there is a level of pressure there that I don't really think I want to deal with, to be honest. <laughs> so what I am doing is I have a website, Wanderlust Recording. Dot com, which was the n original name of the studio, but I am repurposing it to where I am going to offer uh, remote guitar session work, also do remote bass work, and also if uh, there's someone who needs like auto tune correction on their you know vocals, I could do that as well. You know, little jobs here. Well, that sounds awesome. So folks would go to your website and I'm assuming there'd be some sort of contact tab and they'd, they'd fill out the information to get in touch with you. Yeah, exactly. I'm still, I'm like making the final edits right now, but yes, there's a contact tab and there's a lot more information about what I can offer and the gear I'm working with and just about me. I think that's really exciting. And I think that that's a direction that, you know, some of us should move towards. I'd, I'd definitely like to move a direction of that myself. I definitely agree. I think that, you know, not everyone is able to afford an in-house session player where you're getting, you know, great quality oftentimes, but you're spending, you know, hundreds of dollars for a song. Whereas I think, you know, with remote session work, you could hit a good price point that is affordable for a lot of musicians. Absolutely. Definitely less overhead, no having to pay for travel or risk or yeah. any of those things. Now, granted, if you want me in the studio, we could talk about that too. I do offer that as well. 
but that's just a secondary or tertiary option. Awesome. Well, I was looking through Facebook as I often do, and I saw you play in at the High Five Dive Bar with Scratch 2020, and I hear that's one of the more recent groups you've joined up with. How are you liking it so far? Uh, it's been great. They are a lot of fun. If you ever see us out there, you'll just see it's a lot of high energy, uh, a lot of, you know, party covers. And it's something different than, you know, my touring gig, but it's it's just a lot of fun. It gives me a lot of kind of room to kind of do my thing. And uh, everyone in the band's, you know, just really good people. And it's cool to have a local group like that. It makes a difference who you're playing music with. And it looked like y'all were having a great time playing some prints. Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> we do a few print songs. And yes, exactly. So it, it's just, you know, great players in that band. You know, Anna Portalupi's in mm -hmm. the band. And, you know, Anna's a, she's like a little beast. And, you know, on bass and row on drums. Good drummer, great singer. And Haley, you know, she's really become, it, just in the few months that I've played with them, I've watched her grow as a singer. And it's really just impressive, honestly. Well, y'all were right there in the pocket from what I could see from a Facebook video. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now looking over the bio that you sent to me, you referred to yourself as a musical omnivore. What do you mean by that? Uh, so I think of like, you know, an omnivore, like will eat anything, right? And I think that's the way uh, I am and probably a l largely in part to my upbringing. But I also think musicians do themselves a service by being that way. So leaving yourself open to like listening to different types of music and enjoying it, you know, finding like the good stuff about that style of music or that artist and not that you're going to like everything but there's almost something for me in every style of music so i guess that's what i mean by musical omnivore and it's just you know to me it's like music's like food you know and you know in america you know we don't eat the same food every night typically you know why not we might be like oh you want chinese or you want italian or you know mexican it's like just try it all yeah, I think that's an excellent way to be because it gets you away from as much limitation as possible. And when you limit yourself, you can't accomplish too much. So good for you. I think exactly. of myself the same way. Also reading on your bio, which was very well written, by the way. Thank you. Uh, you grew up in New York City, correct? And yeah. you played your first bar gig when you were 16. Yeah. And then was it then that you knew that you'd be pursuing a life of making music at a pro level? I knew I was always going to play music. I didn't know. And at that age, you know, I grew up when I was 16, like the 90s were just starting. And the music industry was vastly different. This was still where you thought of, oh, you know, I get in the band and, you know, we get real tight and we hit the road and we play enough shows and, you know, an A&R guy will find us and we'll get a record deal. And uh, whether that was a myth then even uh, is up for discussion, but it's definitely not the case now. The industry has just changed uh, so dramatically, you know, post digital downloads, Napster. So I don't know. I, I just knew music would always be a part of my life to what degree. And I, I always wanted it to be that that was my job. But admittedly, some of the life choices I made did not support that. And there's a lot of, you know, psychotherapy and stuff that, you know, we don't have enough time to get into the whys of that. But yeah, so I knew music would always be a part of my life. Would it be my profession? I wasn't sure. Awesome. So what took you from New York to, for what I read, next is Texas. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I often joke that why does a man do anything and it's often because of it's a, it's a woman. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. And I won't get into much of the details, but I, I ended up spending 20 years in Texas. And, you know, I ended up playing music there. On Texas has this really kind of cool regional scene. I and mean, it's very insular in a way that you can make a living playing music in Texas. Whereas you go outside of that state or, you know, kind of outside of that region, you know, uh, with Oklahoma and people don't know who you are. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting from a musical perspective. Oh yeah, that Texas scene is it's it's phenomenal. You know, there's there's Guy Clark, there's Ray Wiley Hubbard, there's 
I mean, Todd Snyder, he's not from Texas, but he kind of fits into that scene. He definitely does, yeah. Rodney Crowell, all those guys. Right. And I was also reading that you got to play with Ray Wiley Hubbard, who's one of my heroes as well. I got to see him play Snake Farm more than once. Mm -hmm. Did did y'all play that one? We did not play Snake Farm. But, so it's a really cool story. I was playing a festival with my band, and we were opening up for Ray on that Bill. He was the headliner. We were the band right before him. And I just wrote a tweet where I tagged him in it. Like, I'm opening up for, you know, my songwriting hero, you know, and, you know, Ray. And and he responded. And he was like, do you know you got to move? He's like, play it in D. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like really floored that he responded. And yeah, so I got up on stage and we played an old Mississippi Fred McDowell song, You Gotta Move. And uh, it was just, it was so great. It was, he was such a gracious man. And it was cool. I was backstage when they were loading in. And something that I really took away from it was that his son Lucas plays guitar with him, right? And there was this one moment where they were loading in the amps. And Ray was telling his son, he was like, you know, use the wheels. You know, you don't have to lift it up. You're going to hurt your back. And it was just a dad and his son. It wasn't like, oh, Ray Wiley Hubbard, who Mm -hmm. I had on a, you know, musical pedestal. He was just a guy. And he was just a dad trying to help his son, like trying to teach his son something. And it was, I don't know. I found that just a very endearing moment to see the humanity in, you know, these people you idolize. And we need more of that because they're people too. Absolutely. That, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And you also got to play bass with Robert Randolph. What was that like? Yeah, that was another, it was kind of a similar gig. I was on this festival with, it was a different band that I was playing bass with. And we played this event for like the platinum pass holders. And Robert, he was the headliner of the full festival, but he came out and he played like five songs with us. And he's a super nice guy. And I had to go backstage prior and discuss with him what songs we were going to play. And like, you know, I told him, oh, we do this kind of funky version of like Get Back by the Beatles. And he was like, I remember him like, oh, yeah, how's that go? And he just kind of starts singing it. And he's got his little like he's got like a little lap steel set up and he just starts playing it. Not even knowing the song, like he just, his ear is that good and advanced that he was just like, he was able to sing the melody and then figure it out. And it was just like, man, beautiful. I I just, it was, and he was great. He just, he killed it. And there's a video of me somewhere. And I remember someone saying that the look on your face, just, I was just grinning from ear to ear because it was just so musical and it was just inspiring to play with him. It really was. He definitely exudes a special energy. For anybody who's seen him live, I can tell you that. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Now, the thing I've been so interested about is, you know, you've played with Alma Goldfleece Band and a Brothers Revival, if I'm getting that right. Is that correct? That is Both correct. projects. Yeah. Now, how did your love and appreciation for the Almond Brothers begin? So kind of going back to the musical omnivore thing, I, I really got to blame my family for a lot of that. And I mean that in a good way. It's good blame. So, you know, each family member, I have an older brother and my folks, they all had their own kind of taste in music. And my brother was, you know, big into a lot of the the classic rock stuff. He was big into like Zeppelin and the Allman Brothers. And my dad liked that stuff too. I mean, he liked like Pink Floyd and all that. And I get a lot of that from him. And so we were up at, we have a family house in Massachusetts and we were doing some work on it. And my brother was playing Allman Brothers stuff. And I kept on hearing it and hearing it. I'm like, man, that sounds really kind of cool. And I was like... 15 or 16 at the time, maybe. Yeah. It must've been like 15 or 16. And then Statesboro blues came on and that slide intro that Dwayne does that intro slide solo. It just like kind of made my brain explode. And I'm like, wow, what is that? And I, I, at that point, you know, I really didn't hear anything like that. So, and I mean, I grew up on, you know, Eddie Van Halen was like my first guitar hero. And I, you know, I grew up in the age of Guns N' Roses. And, you know, I loved Clapton, uh, you know, back then and lots of great guitar players. But when I heard that slide playing, it was just so different. And it was, 
it made me feel something, you know, that I didn't feel. And that start kind of started it. And then, I mean, Greg Allman's voice, I mean, clearly the best white blues singer there is, you know, in my book and I think in many other people's book, but I love a good singer. So having that paired with the music of the Allman brothers, it just took me down this road and I've been a fan ever since. And, you know, they really became my favorite band. I saw them in concert uh, seven times and, you know, just it's always been a part, you know, of kind of my musical DNA. And what a good group to have as part of your musical DNA, because there's there's so much that can be gathered from their arrangements, the the twin guitar stuff. That's what I really like to hone in on. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And so let's talk about our mutual friend for a moment, Dave Goldfleece. Now, you said you placed a Craigslist ad when you had relocated this area. How did that become you meeting? So one of the things that I love about my experience in music is that I have these like really great memories that I just can always go back to. And that's one of them. So when I first moved here, I thought I was pretty much done playing music professionally. I thought I was going to kind of give it up, you know, and just kind of, you know, work on some other things. And I said to my uh, now wife, then girlfriend, I was like, you know, Allman Brothers is my favorite band, and I've always wanted to do like a cover band. Maybe I'll find some dudes who can play the music and, you know, we'll play in a garage and maybe play a gig here and there. And it, the joke is, is that my wife said to me, no one cares about the Allman Brothers here. And and she has different musical tastes. I mean, she digs it now. I've made her a believer. But I was like, I'm just doing it for me. I'm not doing it for anyone else. And so I put this ad in Craigslist, pretty much saying, you know, what I'm looking for. And I get an email response. And, you know, he says, hi, my name's David Goldfleece. I played in the Allman Brothers from 78 to uh, 82, 83. I can't remember exactly. And, you know, I've got this band here where we've got Gary Allman, who's a cousin of Greg and Dwayne Allman. And, you know, and we do some Allman Brothers stuff. We do some originals. Would you be interested? So, I mean... Out loud, when I read that email, I was just like, bullshit. (laughs) Yeah. I really thought someone was pulling my leg. And then I looked him up and I'm like, and I, of course, I knew who David Goldfleece was because of, you know, knowing the band, you know, and the history. And I looked him up and I was like, holy crap, he lives in the area. I was like, what if this is like, you know, real? And so, yeah, I went on and, you know, went to uh, an audition and met David and Gary and Joe Weiss was the other guitarist and, you know, the other players. And yeah, they put up with me and it was just beautiful. It was just a really kind of funny, not funny, haha, but just such a weird kind of how in the world did this happen that, you know, my dream is to like... I wanted to do like an Allman Bros cover band and I'm ending up playing music with a guy who is in that band. It just, and especially when I thought I was done playing music, it's just, there are still days where I'm just like, what in the world? You know, it sounds like a real surreal turn of events. Yeah. And, And with who better David is probably one of the most creative and intelligent people I, I've ever met. How would you differentiate a tribute band from a cover band? Ah, that's a good question. So to me, a cover band is like a band that just plays a bunch of cover songs, you know, and uh, which I think everyone probably gets what that is. A tribute band is sort of like the next level up where it's more of a show and there are different there's almost like subgenres within tribute bands. There are tribute bands that, you know, they put on the clothes that look like the artists and they really try to make it like, oh, I'm going to see the Beatles or Elton John or whomever it is. And then there are tribute bands, which we are more like, where we're really just focused on capturing the spirit of the music. And although we do kind of go for the look, We're not going to make it to where like, oh, you got to put on a wig. Mm -hmm. And as much as I want to try to lose weight, I'm never going to look like Dwayne Allman because that (laughs) dude was real thin. So it's just not going to happen, you know? But so, yeah. So I kind of see it like that. Like a tribute band is a show where a cover band does a gig. I think that's a great analogy. I saw 
the Australian Pink Floyd yeah. at Peach Fest, which is an Allman Brothers festival right, up right. in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And they went all out. I mean, they had the inflatable characters from the wall oh, towering over the crowd. They man. had lasers and lights and fog and the whole shebang. It was a show. Yeah. And they played every bit of... They did like half of the wall and half of Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah. And they did it to a T. It was it was excellent. And that's a great point also, though. I think that tribute bands also really try to hone in on the music as well. Cover bands, I think, sometimes take a few more liberties, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Whereas a tribute band is like, you really are trying to nail that song. And some people, I think, are critical of that. When I think about a tribute band really trying to hone in on that music, you're trying to recreate an experience for people. And that's, it's a different kind of deal. It's, it's like going to a Broadway show where they've got to do their thing the same way every night. And we try to do that. We do have a little leeway because we get some solos where we're able to stretch out and kind of do what we do. But we always keep that influence in mind. Like I'm trying to play like in the style of Dwayne Allman or Warren Haynes or whomever it is I am filling that role for. And, you know, it's a good thing that I'm very much influenced by those guys. So it feels very personal to me. So it's not, you know, it, it's still a experience where I feel connected to it and I'm not just playing a part. So what was the main difference between the two projects? Almond Goldflees Band and uh, Brothers Revival. Right. So Almond Goldflees really was a cover band that played some originals or an original band that played some covers. Depends upon, you know, how you look at it. The covers being primarily Almond Brothers songs. But we would do a few others here and there, a few other bands of material. So Brothers Revival is a straight up tribute act. Where, and they even, our agent refers to it as a legacy tribute because we have David in the band. So a legacy tribute is like the next level above tribute where you actually have a former member in the band. So I guess I got to give due there. So Heck yeah. So what do you like about performing with the local groups in St. Andrews? So, you know, what's great about that is there is definitely uh, a little less pressure. You know, it is obviously laid back. And St. Andrew, St. Andrews is like a really cool little scene. Scratch 2020 and I, we play over at House of Bourbon. That's our primary place that we play in St. Andrews. We've got some shows coming up at Salty Hobo in the coming months. And we haven't played other venues here. I haven't played with them. They might have before I joined them. But yeah, I really dig the kind of the scene that's happening here right now. And it seems like there's lots of like musicians that are really supportive of each other. And I, I personally love that. And uh, yeah, it's just like laid back and cool. And, you know, it allows, it gives people room to grow, I think, as artists. And I think a good bit of the folks involved in the scene here are pretty encouraging of each other. Doesn't There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of being territorial or bad blood. And I really appreciate that because it's not like that everywhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I came from a scene where it was like that at first. And at some point it kind of changed. This was back in Texas. And, uh, you know, egos got in the way and honestly chemicals, which can create egos or feed egos. But the point being is that I do appreciate that there are a lot of artists here that are really supportive really willing to help out and really encourage each other to grow. That's a beautiful thing. It really is. And this is a great place to do it. Yep. And so I ask all the musicians on the show this question. I love yeah. asking this question. If you could play any venue in the world, where would it be and why? Yeah. I listen to your podcast, which first, yeah, no, thank you. I actually really appreciate that you give local artists this, you know, kind of a platform and, uh, you know, especially for like younger artists and, you know, people that are kind of new to this whole thing, this allows them to get their chops up. And, you know, even interviewing is, you know, a performance in a way. Yep. So, you know, there's an artistry to it. So, but thank you for doing this. But I listened to, like, I listened to, uh, previously, I listened to your Tyler James interview and uh, Sandy Marlisa and uh, Kelsey and Tyler. Yeah, they were a couple weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago. They were recent. And theirs was really cool. I liked how, you know, she was talking about Red Rocks and all all that. So, but being from New York, I always wanted to play Madison Square Garden. That would be the dream venue, yeah. which the funny thing is Madison Square Garden as the sound of the room is actually awful. 
<laughs> it's really like this big stone or concrete uh, just cylinder. And sound has always been an issue there, but it's just legendary. And I grew up watching bands there, which I would take the Beacon Theater in New York as a very close second. I, I've kind of made that my new goal because... I'm kind of like, okay, wait a second. I wanted to do an Allman Brothers cover band, and here I am doing this Allman Brothers tribute band, and I've got to tour around the country with a member of the band, and also with Mike Koch, who played in the Dickie Betts band for 15 years. And I'm like, maybe if I keep on thinking about these things, you know, it's that whole kind of putting it out there in the world. So maybe if I put out in the world that I want to play the Beacon Theater in New York City... Maybe it can happen. Yeah, put it down on paper, say it in the mirror. Yeah, That's right. Absolutely. Were you playing around the area? Well, not just the area, anyway. Uh, so, a Brothers Revival, we had some cancellations due to like COVID and stuff, regrettably. But in a couple of weeks, we're headed to uh, South Carolina and North Carolina. And uh, we're playing the Newberry Opera House in Newberry, South Carolina. And then the High Point Theater in High Point, North Carolina. And then in November, we're actually going up, you know, and this is all hoping that, you know, depending upon what's going on with COVID, but we have some dates in Connecticut and Pennsylvania. And then with Scratch 2020, we're going to be here in St. Andrews and we play also in Apalachicola a bunch at High Five. That's just a fun place to play. And, you know, really great crowd, you know, great venue. They take good care of us. And uh, that's primarily where we're at. We do some stuff in Panama City Beach and that's great too. But I got to say like House of Bourbon right here in St. Andrews, I love playing here. So it's, you know, usually we have a great crowd and maybe I'm a little biased because I live nearby. It's not far for me at the end of the night. I just get to go home and, you know, just veg out. I love those kind of gigs. (laughs) (laughs) It's so easy, you know? So, you know, as much as I love being on the road and doing the tour thing, which is just an amazing experience. There's something nice to be able to play music and go sleep in your own bed. And so one more time, tell us how folks can find you online and beyond and any additional details, uh, your new guitar remote studio sure. venture. Yeah, yeah. So the website is wanderlustrecording.com. And the reason for that real quick is originally when I built it, the whole idea was that I could just travel to you and record you wherever you are. But now I'm just repurposing it where it's really just more about session work. So, but the website's still up and I was like, it's still a cool name. And I love to travel also. So Wanderlust, it's kind of, you know, it works with that whole theme. So wanderlustrecording.com and then on socials, you could typically find me as one more guitarist. And it's the number one more guitarist. That's going to be on Instagram, Facebook. I have a YouTube page and also TikTok. So even us Gen Xers are getting in on TikTok these days. And But really the real quick story about that is when I first moved to Texas and I was near Austin and I started playing in the Austin area, everyone is a guitarist. It reminded me like of LA where everyone's an actor. And I was like, man, I'm just one more guitarist. Mm -hmm. And so it was just kind of a tongue in cheek thing. I like to kind of joke around. So, but yeah, so one more guitarist on the socials, Wanda Lust Recording dot com for the remote session work and uh, yeah well excellent i'm excited to come see y'all play sometime maybe we won't be working at the same time and yeah. just good luck to you and your new ventures and i hope folks hit you up about that because that's that sounds like some really awesome work to get into again thank you so much matt for taking your time to be here today on the st andrews jezebel podcast and until next time keep st andrews salty This piece of old news is called Chasing Rainbows, and it was published in the St. Andrews Bay News September 28th in 1935. The author's not listed. I chose this piece because it's a reminder that not all glitters is gold. We definitely see a lot of shiny things in our daily lives, but are they really what's best for us? I hope y'all enjoy this one. Chasing Rainbows Chasing Rainbows always calls to mind child's play, yet there are so many adults who go through life flitting first after one rainbow, and then another, never tiring and never catching up with one, nor ever getting anywhere. 
A fellow being may have a good job or position and getting along fairly well when he sees another opening and it looks far more attractive. He immediately flops over and finds something just beyond looks much better. The manner in which some people go from one thing to another is not unlike the old man who started to market to sell his cow, which he traded off for something, and this he traded off for something else, and he kept up his trading until he found that all he had left of the original cow was a grindstone, and he realized this was too heavy to carry the distance. So he dumped it in a mill pond and thereby felt greatly relieved. Sometimes it is good to change if it is for the better, but never be attracted by something that glitters and beckons, for there is another old adage that reminds one that all is not gold that glitters. Sometimes it has proven profitable to stay put and take what comes your way. Thank you all so much for tuning into episode 46 of the St. Andrews Jezebel podcast. If you're a salty local with an interesting story about St. Andrews and you'd like to be on the podcast, then I'd love to hear from you. Please DM me either on Facebook or Instagram. Always, thank you to everyone who's been sharing the podcast with all their salty friends. Y'all are the best, too. Our theme song was written by me and recorded by Dave Schwartz on the campus of Gulf Coast State College, and the interview was recorded at Floriopolis in historic St. Andrews. The rest of the podcast was written and recorded by me in my music room. Till next time. Keep St. Andrew salty. Red lipstick, so thick, and a push-up bra. Tramp stamp, stretch marks, and a lacy thong, cause she's a Jezebel. St. Andrew Jezebel, cause she's a Jezebel. St. Andrew Jezebel.